What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations, 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. And once a month, I host conversations with a four, sorry, four fathers that are co-sponsored by Dad Central, Canada's national fatherhood organization, and Dove Men Care. And as always, you like to know that I say you're blessed highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. And you're going to meet another new friend on the Dr. Vibe Show tonight, though him and I have known each other for a long time, but we've never sat down. And these days we can't do it face to face, but at least digitally, this is the first time in many years I've been able to corner this gentleman and he don't even got that much time. Like, like I feel like, I, I, I'm, like I'm like at a meat counter taking a, a ticket for what I want to order, but this is all good. So let's get some context first. Um, the new humanity in, 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 initiative, in, initiative, I'm going to say that, and Canada's CFOs Inc. in partnership with the Canadian Association of Urban Financial Professionals, along with a cast of amazing speakers and thought leaders are going to promote with another event and amplify equity, diversity, and inclusion in the accounting and finance sector. What's the name of the event? It's called Leadership and Change in the Accounting and Finance Interactive Digital Event. It's happening this Thursday, November 12th. And the we got the head honcho. He's not a bottle washer. He's a head honcho. Hugh Anthony Simmons, he's had a PhD, is the co-founder and chair of the New Humanity Initiative. And we're going to bring him on right now because... The man don't got lots of time, and he's taking pictures of me while we're doing this. So we're going to bring him on and say, welcome to Hugh Anthony. What is going on? You've got yourself on mute. Take yourself on mute, off mute my brother. Okay. Oh, okay. There okay. we go. You see, you were, take, you were so much focused on taking me which I received that. I, I I believe I'm handsome, but you know. What's what's going on, Hugh? You good? I have been blessed and highly favored, my friend. How are you, Dr. Vibe? Like I say, uh, a number of things. I'm a magnet for miracles, a solution for someone's problem, blessed and highly favored. And you know what? Yeah. Too blessed to be stressed. Ah, love that. Love that. That makes two of us. It's Absolutely. really an honor to be on on the show yet again it's it's well, been a minute i know i know no, I know. no it's been an hour forget the minute piece it's been an hour it's been an hour <laughs> and you know what you 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 purposely made sure you don't have a lot of time like but we're gonna get you back but it, it's gonna be a minute not an hour okay okay well, all I right really congratulate you on the amazing work you continue to do on this platform and just the recognition that you did receive from the Canadian ethnic media is a testament to the lives you're changing and the amazing work. Thank you so much. Well, I received that and right back to back at you. Folks, if you if we had the time to read his bio, <laughs> you'd say, What am I doing on this screen? Right? But he's getting off easy today. Next time, he ain't gonna get off easy because I'm gonna read the whole thing. <laughs> so you know what and you know what we 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 need to laugh especially these days so we yeah. so this is important and i always say to people these days give yourself grace Thank so you. we make sure we give our especially black people you need to give yourself grace because if yeah. you're not careful life will kill you yes that's another yeah. conversation brother <laughs> hugh uh, yeah, it's been an hour so you have to give a like, condensed little background about yourself okay. before we get to the full roll Okay, well, thank you so much. Well, the most important thing I want to share is that I am a lover of life, a giver of gifts, and a receiver of blessings. And my role here, I am the co-founder and co-chair of the New Humanity Initiative, which is a purpose-filled organization committed to fundamental change for racial justice, equity, and access for Black, Indigenous, and people of color throughout Canada or home and native land. I wear the hat of being a teaching faculty at Ryerson University, where I would muse daily. However, what's crucial is that from a purpose-fueled lens, I always say that service is the rent we pay for living. And it is in the service of humanity that 
I have been ushered to do what I do. And I really was want to just share that. So, okay, I'm going to at least take a bit of that before we get right into the organization of the conference. Yeah. When did you recognize or realize that your life would be one of service? Uh, it, it's interesting. That's an interesting question, Dr. Vibe. I found that out when I was around nine years old. And interestingly, how I found that out was the fact that I had an encounter, which was an accidental one, where I saw two adults fighting. And, you know, your parents at the time growing up, you avoid fights at all costs, get out of the way of danger. So I stood behind a chain link type of fence. And funny enough, a stone was thrown. I was leaning on the fence and it hit me in my side. And for about seven hours of my life, I couldn't speak at all. I was just trying to speak and no sound was coming out. And I then realized that I don't like to see people hurting, but when I lost my voice and regained it, it hit me the power of having a voice. And it is in that recognition and that moment, as a nine-year-old kid, I, re I realized that my purpose is to serve humanity mm. and all, you know, sentient beings. Yes. No problem. So, again, because you're getting away because your time is tight today. But next time we come back, <laughs> yeah, we're going to drill it, yes. so much. We're going <laughs> to yeah. drill so much in the journey because I believe that everyone has a story to share and it will impact at least one positive person. And yes. I know bits about your story, but I'm blessed to have a global audience and I know it can impact people worldwide. That's for the next, that's for the next conversation. All right. Let's talk about the new humanity initiative. Well, how did that come about? Uh, you know, it, I come from the lens where 2020 has been a phenomenal year of evils, blessing, changes, and of course, opportunities. And the New Humanity Initiative emerged out of the George Floyd killings that happened in Minneapolis in the USA this past summer. And when that happened, I had a decision to make, do I get enraged or do I get engaged? And I chose the latter. And seven days after George Floyd's death, I just got a blueprint for what now we're talking about the new humanity initiative would emerge to be. And you know, when I say purpose fueled, it is that we have this opportunity here in Canada and the world over to really embody and embolden a call for a new humanity and a new collective that promotes a new humanized social contract. So for example, here in Canada, we are, um, we are members of the United Nations. However, the Canadian government is not a signatory to the declaration of by the United Nations on indigenous peoples. They're not a signatory to the declaration of the UN decade for people of African descent. So when we think of those two crucial declarations that would embody or multiculturalism, embrace or diversity, which is a fact, as a, as a nation, as a home and native land, and the fact that inclusion is a choice. The New Humanity Initiative really is about bringing those embodiments and the enduring aspirations of people, BIPOC in particular, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, to transform ch and bring change and people-centered programming that really engenders that type of respect you know, for their human rights, their well-being, and their mobility, whether it's economic or social, and more engagement and inclusion.
Okay. So from the time you thought about this vision yeah. to it becoming a ra reality, what was the space of time? So it, so it, it, it kickstarted in terms of a blueprint seven days after George Floyd's death, which would be May wow. 25, 2020. So on June 1st, I got the blueprint. And by August 12th, we were having our inaugural equity, wow. diversity, inclusion, and inclusion, the community conference, which had over 700 participants from over seven countries wow. globally. Okay, so hold on a second. <laughs> hold on a second. No, 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 yeah. no. The, the minute has got the hours come down to 30 seconds now. Yeah, yeah. What made it so successful on the first outing in retrospect? Because you've done a few now. What were yeah. the keys to success? Because I think it's very important in all types of ventures. What were mm -hmm. some of the keys to success? Because people can apply some of these to other opportunities. Thank you for that great question. And I call it the zeitgeist or zeitgeist of our time. What's the mood that the society globally was experiencing? It was a time and a call that we cannot continue this normal. We have this opportunity to embrace the voices, the appeals, and the reckoning of what's been happening globally to people of African descent, especially in the West. You know, when we saw what happened in Italy, in Brazil, when we saw what happened in the US, in the UK, and it, you know, here in Canada, it, 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 it beckoned that we needed to build on not just the Black Lives Matter movement, but the, the, the cry for racial justice, the cry for social justice, and also the cry to upend police brutality on black people and the continued oppression and uh, violation of treaty rights of indigenous. So the, the, the mood of the society to beckons that we respond to the challenge of change. All right. Fantastic. What were your memories of the first event? Because I, well, I, I was there, so I want to see what you remember. Well, you know, I, I tell you, I can breathe a sigh of relief now having this conversation with you. <laughs> because the, 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 the trepidation was yeah. how we were going to navigate this event that I now call an amazing experience, given the fact that we ended up having to upgrade the or Zoom platform within 24 hours of the event. But mm -hmm. what, I, what, I, what I do remember, it's individuals, especially within our broader society, when we speak about performative allyship, for example, or perform a statement around, okay, this is what organizations want to do as it relates to advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion, you know, in light of the fact that we're talking around the whole thing upending police brutality, upending the oppression that black people face in societies, Western and otherwise. And one thing I recall was initially when we threw the idea out, it did not build track and not until we had our guest or keynote speaker and when we got our keynote speaker and we got the support of a black professional organization here in canada and of course a representative from uh different city councils then people started asking who are your speakers? Who are your speakers? And this event was complimentary. We weren't charging this as with the upcoming event. What we did was to go out there and plan this event, responding to the mood of the time with faith that this was a conversation that needed to happen. And we had to be bold enough to take it up. 
Wonderful. Uh, going back to those initial days, uh, mm. for lack of a better term, pitching <laughs> this idea to people, was, was the buy-in immediate? Was there buy-in, mm, I want to see what you guys do before I buy in? And, you know, being a new organization, you get that. And one thing that I, I, I'm grateful for, and I use the term that, you know, with the New Humanity Initiative, we've been ushered. I, I just have to give a shout out here and a plug to uh, my wife, Sharon, who was at an event uh, back in June, mid to late June, and she became a crowd puller. And I think the question was asked, what did you do to bring people in? And then she said to the organizers, you know what? They asked her, oh, would like you to deliver a blockbuster event for us. And she said, oh, she, have a, she had, a, had an idea. And she said, I know my husband just formed a national nonprofit focusing on that. And, you know, it got traction. Mm -hmm. And the partners came in and they said, let's have a conversation. The conversation moved into an action plan. And this was literally what happened. And we just pivoted from an idea, from a blueprint to what we are now experiencing six months on with the New Humanity Initiative. I really want to give a shout out to, you know, all the partners and all the supporters and the participants who came out to engender what I now share as an amazing experience to build allyship, to build support and to build transformative change as it relates to racial equity and justice. Who came up with the name? The name came, it came with the blueprint uh, that I got seven days after George Floyd. Wow. So that blueprint came to me and I woke up uh, the, the morning around 3.30 a.m. June 1. And I share with you, Dr. Vibes, and your listener, I didn't stop writing for seven hours. Mm. Something was that, in you. Something was in, yes. And I am the conduit, yes. Wonderful. Uh, for our audience, what are some of the events you have previously held? What's some of the topics that you've previously chatted about? Interestingly, I I have chatted around servant leadership, uh, public speaking. I've chatted around networking and storytelling. And in terms of uh, my whole experience being in nonprofit, we've also championed youth mentorship, youth entrepreneurship, and the creative art. So it's, you know the opportunity to be part of this amazing organization and this amazing experience and now championing equity, diversity, inclusion, belonging and community really emerged out of the fact that it's the energy and the approach I brought to my humanity and my love for people. You know, as you say, you're a solution to someone's problem. And I believe that service is the rent we pay for living. So my being in the service of humanity, when the call beckoned, I had the opportunity with my team to respond. So it's interesting. Uh, I will share with your listeners too that I started to also write some lifestyle articles on Medium around the issue. So, you know, if one wants to get a feel of what some of my thoughts and perspectives are around this issue that relates to our humanity, they can check out some of my articles on medium.com and or uh, LinkedIn, which we'll share that link later. So yeah, it, it, it it's interesting coming from a background in higher education, my appreciation for the creative arts, my appreciation for leisure, you know, because I'm interested in how people live, play, and work. And if you notice, I work latter, but, but my my work has been in that area, you know, being in the multi sectors that I've had engagement and experiences in. 
That is excellent. Let me continue because time is going fast, uh, purposely, yeah. <laughs> purposely on your end. I, you got yeah. me. It's all right. I, yeah, I got we'll, you. We'll I got cut it. You. Yeah, we'll cut it close. It's okay. No problem. Uh, I'm blessed, and I say that word a lot. I'm blessed to have a worldwide audience, especially in America. Yeah. Could you give me and share with them through your lens the state of equity and diversity in Canada at this present time? Uh, good, good point, and I and I'd be honored to share that, Doctor Vibe. And when when we talk about our home and native land, you know, Canada, the thing that the Americans will think of us is that we're goody two shoes. But I say to you that here in Canada, we do have the issues around embracing equity, diversity inclusion and belonging and building what I call communities. We still have the oppression of people who are BIPOC, you know, black, indigenous and people of color. And it, it's, it begins with the fact that when we look at what's happened, you know, around how we do not have culturally sensitive services as it relates to or indigenous peoples. We don't have culturally sensitive services as it relates to black people and people of color, even though Canada is a bastion for multiculturalism and diversity. And when we think about that, I, I, put, I put it out to share with our listeners that we've had a checkered history as a nation in how we treat individuals who are black, indigenous, and our people of color. And, and the very thing I, I would share is that we've got to rethink change and initiatives and also the conversations about race and racism here as we would in the US. And why I say that is, you know, in quote, I can't breathe, that ricocheted from the, the lips of George Floyd, riverbaits in the annals of our souls here in Canada also. And when we think about that inhumane death and that social injustice, it, it happens here in, in, in Canada. And when we talk about the state of equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. I will say to you this forthcoming conference that we are organizing and the one we organized previously, a lot of mainstream organizations did not want to touch the subject. Media houses don't want to touch the subject around equity, diversity, and inclusion, especially when it comes from the lens that we're not talking about putting just white people on a board because their understanding of diversity is having more white women on board or understanding of diversity in its genuine essence. It's about recognizing that diversity is a fact, it's not a choice, and that we all are collective members of what should be a just and equitable society. So there's a lot of work to be done because, you know, there is those narratives that are there, Dr. Vibe and listeners, around, you know, the dance of divisiveness and the body politic of narrative, where, you know, we use the terms as visible minority. Why, why would you call your citizen a visible minority? So who is the unspoken majority? And when we talk about the issues around the legacy of racism, yeah, the, the, the George Floyd protest really was the, what we, we, we say, you know, the straw that broke the camel back in terms of uh, an expression. But Canada does have systemic and deep root racism as the US because we've had premiers in Ontario and Quebec and even our national police force, the RCMP head saying that they don't believe there's systemic racism in Canada. However, the reality is different. 
-hmm. and we see the tabloid. So yeah, so that's why I spoke to, you know, some of the articles I wrote to really share with, you know, readers and those who are interested in the subject to learn more around how our home and native land, that's called Canada, really, you know, fall back on the idea that, you know, we here are a beacon of comparative progressive progressivism. However, on race, as well as on other host of issues, there's a lot of work to be done. And that's where the New Humanity Initiative comes in and our team. Excellent, fantastic. Well, as again, as time is running down, tell us about what's coming up this Thursday, November 12th from 10.30 a.m. Eastern to 12.30 p.m. Eastern. Well, the exciting event that's forthcoming is our leadership and change in accounting and finance EDI event, which is equity, diversity, and inclusion event. And the focus is on economic mobility, which is one of the pillars of the new humanity initiative. And interestingly, why one would ask, why are we doing a sector specific? But, uh, you know, uh, McKinsey and company did a research and realized that when we look at Fortune 500 companies, there are less than 4% of black and indigenous individuals that were represented on major corporate boards. Then we then dig deep into the data and found that also in this sector, which is global in its genome and makeup, in senior leadership, these BIPOC voices are often not present. So why why this? We decided to take on, you know, one of the more challenging conversations around the sector to see then how we can bring about, you know, meaningful and transformative change as it relates to accounting and finance and creating economic mobility for BIPOC individuals in the sector. So we have on Thursday, November 12th, starting at, well, we, we officially opened the gates at 10, 15 a.m. and excited to share that Kirk Four Corners Sensari, who is the official DJ of the Toronto Raptors, the 2019 NBA champions, will be opening the event as our musical stylist. And I want to give a big shout out to Kirk for being on the platform with us Thursday. And we open uh, with our first session around transformation and belonging, because a lot of times when we talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion, the conversation around belonging doesn't happen. And when it comes to BIPOC individuals, they need to have organizations and opportunities to show up as their whole selves. They don't need to leave part of who they are somewhere else and just bring a part of them at work. So we have the opening session being uh, transformation and belonging, which is one of our dialogues on diversity session. Then we'll have a panel discussion with representatives right across the sector. I'm excited to say that we have uh, Leon Hannaway, who is the CEO of Wealth Nouveau, one of the first black general manager of the Toronto Stock Exchange coming oh. on. Yes, the, as one of our panelists, we are excited to have on uh, Deborah Rosati, who were who is the founder and CEO of Getting Women On Board. And Deborah's been doing work with a lot of our organization to bring about changes, actually, to how boards are structured to get more representation from women, then of, uh, I, I'm excited to say we have William Onuwa, who is uh, executive vice president and chief audit executive for RBC, which we'll say RBC Royal Bank, who will be on the panel also. And that excitement in terms of bringing diverse voices to the conference will you know will help us because we have Mona Jami who is a, the chief inclusion officer who is coming from PwC Canada and also Caroline Gale who is a managing director at 
Accenture Canada. So we have this amazing panel of thought leaders who will be sharing with us, but, but that's not the only exciting thing. We also have what's called Voices in Action. So building on our previous event, we are saying, okay, we've heard what the issues are. So the, we've created the concurrent Voices in Action segment, which speaks now to tell us what are some of the actions, what are some of the strategies, what are some of the techniques organizations been implementing, been doing, been exploring to advance well-being, to amplify equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging in their organization. So we have you know, representatives from TD, Wealth Management, I, 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 I can share Colin Lynch, who is one of their vice president there at TD, and also a Canada Top 40 Under 40 nominee and honoree who will be sharing with us. You, we, we have Merle Africa, who is the president of the Canadian Association of Urban Financial Planners, sharing with us. Also, Philip Mayer, who is the SVP and Chief Financial Officer for Sagan, and Michael Williams, who is the Chief Risk Officer, General Counsel for Richardson GMP, and also the founder of the Black Opportunity Fund, sharing with us, just to name a few of the individuals who will be on the Voices in Action. And I'm excited to say that ACCA Canada, through their support and representative Jillian Cows, who will be one of our moderators for the Voices in Action segment. And we have had some additions to our Voices in Action panel. We have from, and I will call this SAP Canada or SAP Canada, Christine Diaz, who will be joining us. So there are a number of speakers that will be coming on board to share with us what are some of the action strategies and techniques that have been taking place in their organization that we can learn from and share with other organizations. And CPA Canada will be anchoring one of our dialogues in diversity to speak about what they have been doing in that space as it relates to advancing Black, Indigenous, and people of color and we do have indigenous voices. So I'm excited to say that we have a couple, I think three fireside chats and I want people to listen and come out and share in the fireside chat, but also the fireside chat on indigenous perspective. We have Shannon Metatawabin, who is the CEO of the National Aboriginal Capital Corporation Association, who will be sharing with us on the topic enabling prosperity through capital. And while we have a male indigenous representative, we also have a female indigenous representative in the name of Shannon Peston, who is the senior advisor, business and finance for Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub, and also founder and CEO of Peston Consulting, who will share with us empowering indigenous women entrepreneurship and economic mobility. And, you know, so we build on those exciting happenings around the event. And we also have a fireside chat with Ken Green and Celia, who will be bringing some Groundhog Day techniques to share with our listeners around how we can build robust businesses that can enable financial and economic mobility for BIPOC individuals. So just to share a few with you, and we will, of course, be entertained with the musical styling of Kirk, Four Corners, St. Cyrus, you know, the Toronto Raptors official DJ, and support from our highlights from our supporters, whom, you know, I, I have to give a shout out to CFO Canada Inc. and of course, when I talk Canada CFO Inc., and when I talk about the Canadian Association of Urban Financial Professional, I really have to give a shout out to them for being our partners in this event. And to our, you know, supporters, I will say we thank we thank you for coming out. You know, 
as I said, ACCA, beautiful graphics, CAMH, Toronto Jobs, BBPA, the Black Business and Professional Association, Graphon Advisors, Crow, and of course, Wealth Nouveau. I really want to give a shout out to the support we're getting from these organizations and LumiQ and Calix Valuation, just to name some of them. And of course, we have GMS Chartered Professional Accountants, Professional Association, just supporting our event. And really, this is what makes a world of difference because we're going to focus on a, on a sector that has seen little or no change in the senior executive ranks as it relates to advancement of BIPOC people in leadership and inclusion. So we're talking about leadership and we're talking about what changes we need to bring to make that happen nationwide. You got it all in, didn't you? <laughs> I <do. laughs> thank you, thank you, so, thank so you. I'm gonna ask a favor. Sure, I need sure. two more minutes of your time. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, first, go got ahead. a great question from one of my core supporters from the United States, Claude Diamond. And also, uh, I just want to make sure that we put up information on the screen, which I have already, but also your personal information. Yeah. So one minute to answer this question from okay. Claude Diamond. All right, go Your ahead, Claude. The question is, doesn't capitalism look mostly toward profitability and performance rather than diversity? You only have a minute, so this is why you got to come back next time because I think All this right. is a whole conversation right. piece in itself. And thank you, Claude. This is an excellent question. And when we talk about change, we have to reframe, revisit, and restructure the type of capitalism that we're talking about. We need to move from profitability-driven capitalism to sustainable capitalism. So we talk about stakeholder capitalism in this context. And we have to move from the focus on profit to people. We have to move the focus from profitability to sustainability. So I, I share this with you too, and I know I have a minute to respond, is that when we think about how best can we navigate what is the zeitgeist of our time, climate change, climate action, racial justice, equity, and reforming what we now understand as capitalism, which needs to neoliberalist type capitalism needs to be flipped on its head. And the reason I say that, because we need to have a new conversation around how we engage, how we account, and how we protect the environment in this period. And why I say that, and, and I appreciate the question from Claude, is that I had the opportunity you know, some time ago, earlier this year, to attend uh, an event with ACCA Canada. And the question is, how can business incorporate accounting for climate emergency in their reporting? Because that's a clear and present danger. How can businesses account for equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging? Because also that is a clear and present danger. And the, the, the suggestion comes back, and, I, and we'll, I'll come back to that, is that I propose a collaborative framework that we look at business in, in incorporating context and content for their mission, the values and policies that guide their organization, resources and resolutions to understand and disclose value creation and societal impact. Because we can't speak about profitability now without sustainability. We can't talk about profitability without a people-centered approach to stakeholder engagement. Okay. Uh, I'm going to cut it right there because yes. that is a great conversation topic for you to come back. And I think also if you want to invite some people, I think that, that, co yes. that question in itself it's yes. a whole hour it's a, right there. It's I, will, loaded. I, yeah. I will put up on the screen Claude's follow-up yeah. saying, but doesn't North America have the best quality of life compared to other countries? So you don't have but, to get... No, I'm, I'm going to hit it. And thank okay. you, Claude. I, I, I think we have so much to be grateful for. 
but how do we define quality of life? And, and that, what are the metrics that we use? What are the elements that we use when we define quality of life? Is it when one speaks to per capita income, does that really define quality of life? When Western societies are so caught up with debt incurring uh, citizen experience, when we talk about well being, what do we mean when there isn't equal access to health, education, and mobility? So, when we talk about quality of life, we have to revisit the metrics. And I promise you, once Dr. Vibe will have me, we need to continue this conversation, Claude. But thank you for that Absolutely. question. Absolutely. That great questions. Yeah. And I'll be hounding Hugh prolifically yeah. after his event to have yeah. him on and actually bring some other people on because I think there's a myriad of conversation topics. Hugh, yeah. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your positive productive schedule to share with us uh, continued success, not only professionally, but personally. And Thanks. do you have any final words for our audience? And I will certainly put up your contact information on the screen. So go ahead. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank you for tuning in to the Dr. Vibe conversation, because what we have in the Dr. Vibe show is the most wise, audience that you ever can have. And I thank each and every one of you because the curated conversations we have, it's not happening anywhere else. And that's why my promise to you is that I'll be back on the Dr. Vibe show where we will have great curated conversation. Fantastic. There is Hugh's contact information. Probably the best thing is LinkedIn because he does yeah. most <laughs> pro prolifically on LinkedIn that's and thanks. also put on this, that yes. is the email address for the New Humanity Initiative. And also finally, but not la finally, the information for the event coming up this Thursday. If you can make it, as you can tell already, it's gonna be a very deep, deep and meaningful and positive productive conversation. Yes. So I'm going to close out here and just say, it is Dr. Vibe, that is me. This is me, Dr. Vibe. If you want to get a hold of me, the best place is my website, the D R V I B E S H O W dot com. Everything, Dr. Vibe, there. Repeat conversations, posts, how to get a hold of me is all there. I'd like to thank people who watch this live to make help make it an epic conversation. Claude Diamond, Birdie Lynn, and others, thank you so much for either watching live, watching the replay, or listening to the replay. It's appreciated, not taken for granted. I always close out with this. Live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Then block assumptions and aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. Again, you're blessed and highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. And walk good. God bless. Peace be well. Keep the faith. And thanks for watching. And give yourself grace. Good night, everybody.